really pray that uh, next few weeks, this week and next week, it's uh, um, really make an impact in people's lives and relationships, which is all about what we're talking about this next few weeks, this week and next week. Then we have something else at the end of the month. And then um, in November, we'll start a new book. And then there's the end of the year and do it all over again in January. So, man, that came fast, isn't it? And um, it amazes me how fast we go through. And um, oftentimes people say, man, you took a long time on these uh, studies. Well, there's a lot to say. God's word is deep. And, um, but it's, it's not so much how long it takes as how much we understand what it says. And many times people just want to go through it fast and thinking like, well, the, you, don't get, uh, you don't get extra points for going through it fast. Um, you, get, you get extra points by keeping what it says, and you have to understand what it says in order to keep that. So let's pray and ask the Lord, marriage and relationships, second, second part, and then we'll do another one next week, uh, more specifically dealing with the roles of husbands and wives next week. So hopefully um, that will encourage people to come and to hear the word. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for tonight. Uh, For today and tonight too, Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We ask you, Lord, that you'd help us in understanding your word, help us to apply it in our lives. Jesus said, a wise man is one who hears the word and does what you taught. And so, Lord, we want to build our house upon the teaching of Jesus, upon the rock and what he said. Lord, you said a foolish man hears but doesn't do what you said. And so, Lord... Help us to have ears to hear, hearts to understand, Lord God, and give us your spirit so that we would obey you in keeping what you said, Lord. You said uh, that there is those who hear the word, and we also need to keep the word. And so we ask you to help us to put it in action, for it is in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. I shared with you last week that in marriage and relationships, uh, it it really began, and, and I usually do this from time to time. Um, we should do it more often, but from time to time, there's things that perk us up. And one of the things that, that perked up my interest was the fact of an epidemic of young people that have really not just our absence of marriage, but are against marriage. It's really an epidemic. It's really a worldview, and it's a spiritual worldview, where they would abandon the natural state of humanity, which is the way God created us, which is husband and wife husband in relationships with their wives, and they are seeking to overthrow that. They're seeking to unyoke themselves of what they called, and unfortunately they call it patriarchy, right? They call it patriarchy, they call it conservatism, and what they're really throwing off, it's really biblical principles and teachings. Unfortunately, when you see what relationships they seek, oftentimes without marriage, it becomes nothing more than brokenness, hardships, and very much um, drug abuse, sexuality, promiscuity, um, divorces, increases in, uh, um, in unwanted pregnancies, increases in um, abortion. And it does decline, not only themselves, but the overall society. Think about this, and I want to be very clear. Marriages are a great blessing. They are. They are a great blessing when you do it the Lord's way. They are a great blessing to yourself. It is a great blessing to your children. It is a great blessing to churches and ministries. And it's a great blessing to society. Don't ever mis- mistake that. Don't ever misunderstand that or undermine it. It is a great blessing. That's why God gave it. So they could be the fabric of society. It could be a great blessing to all people if done the right way. This is why we always say that church, community of believers, is as strong as the weakest marriage. It's as strong as the weakest marriage. So our constant battle, it's an uphill battle at times, it's to strengthen the relationships between husbands and wives and ultimately the relationships of believers with other believers. But the healthiest a church, the, whole, the healthiest the marriages are, the healthiest the church is going to be. And so you are going to find out that in our society, there's so many brokenness. There's so many broken homes, so many. And unfortunately, psychologists go out and they tell these young ladies and young men. And they say, you know what? 
divorce is good for you. You need to be happy, and therefore you need to have this. And, and it's good for kids, by the way, they say. And, um, and, and it's okay the children go through that. They're going to learn, and it's healthy for them. No, it's not. I, I don't think people that say that ever had children, honestly. Many of, and this is not to discourage those that are good within marriage counseling, but I found that in marriage therapy and marriage counseling, a lot of people that give that, and this is just my own observation, I could be completely 100% wrong, please prove me wrong. Many of them come from themselves, come from broken homes and broken relationships, and it's sort of like they're trying to undo what they never had. And um, many of them are not married, many of them don't have children. Uh, it's hard to receive counsel, right, and advice from people that didn't ever have children. You know, it, it's, it's easy to pontificate. Oh, your brother, you need to do that, you need to do that. Well, have you ever done it? Oh, no, but you need to do it. It's easier to say that, isn't it, but harder to do. I'd rather sit with a couple that have been faithful together for 50 years and hear them out than some psychologist that never had a marriage, or if they, if they had one, it's broken, and someone who just sat there with their wife and their, and their husbands with their Bible open and, and seek the Lord. I'd rather sit with them than some high-paid psychologist because I know what I'm going to get from that couple. I'm going to get God's word. I'm going to receive what God has for me. Now, since the 1970s, of course, marriage rapidly began to decline. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is empirical evidence. So you, can, you guys find it on your own if you need to. I brought some charts last week, but didn't bring them this week. Um, not many people before that got divorced. But since the 1970s, it's been declining. The marriage is declining and divorces have been increasing. So it's a, a parallel. You know, it's, an, it's, it's a reaction to the fact that there are no marriages, the increasing in divorces. And young people increasingly don't want to have any to do with marriage. And they didn't want to have children either. So this is why it's a global problem too, by the way. Any country that you find, especially in Europe and America, you have declining birth rates. And many people are concerned. Why? Because demographic is destiny. Demographic is destiny. No one escapes it. The less children you have, population decreases. Eventually, you're going to have more problems. Population is at least above a two in birth rates. Replacement, what they call it. You know, every husband and wife, and then they have two children. That's replacement. That's the minimum. Uh, and the U.S. is well, well below 1.8, well below 1.8. And so, obviously, that's the world. Obviously, this things that happen in life and society is going to go that way. But what about the Christian church? That's my main concern from at the beginning is what do we do with Christians who may adopt these thinking? And don't get me wrong. Many Christians have this thinking, unfortunately, a worldview that is um, based on society, that's based on what society believes in the spirituality of society. You know, the Germans had this wonderful word it's called the Zeitgeist. Zeitgeist. And as a German word, it just simply means the spirit of the age. What, what do people think? How do people relate? And unfortunately, many people in churches adopt this view because it's society view, right? So they adopt that which society believes and they bring it into the church and they abandon biblical thinking and biblical thought. So the book of John and the book of 1 John, I should say, teaches us, that we're not to love this world, but we're to love Christ. And we're to love the teachings of Christ, and we're to love each other in such a way that pleases him. And it's a very important book. We're going to be reading that later on. Now, last week we read the theology of marriage. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. I told you that it's a Hebrewism. It's a Hebrewism that means that there's nobody that's going to be closer to me than you. You're it, baby. That's it. There's nobody that's going to be closer to me than you. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And that establishes the relationship between men and women. Men and women together in marriage, right? husband and wife. And that is what marriage is. It's what establishes marriage and what ultimately we see the picture. We're going to see the bigger picture that marriage represents, because it's mainly, it's mainly a reflection. Now, you read from Matthew 19, our sister Nora gives us that wonderful reminder of what Jesus said. If you turn there, I'm not going to go through it verse by verse, but we are going to paint the picture since we read it already. Matthew 19, the way Matthew is constructed, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And, and this is not a class on hermeneutics or anything like that. But if you look at the context before marriage, is about forgiveness, 
the context about marriage, before that, marriage and divorce, it's about forgiveness. Why? It's no coincidence. In order to stay married, there's going to have to be a lot of forgiveness, a lot of forgiveness. And um, boy, if, you, if you're married, you know exactly what I mean. It has to have that relationship. But overall, isn't it? Because why? Uh, overall, when we get married in this sinful world, we're still going to have our flesh, even as believers, an old nature that wants to sin. And we're going to mess up according to, obviously, weaknesses and frailties that we all carry. It needs to be forgiveness. Now, the way Matthew is constructed is forgiveness, marriage, talking about divorce. The next context is, of course, children. The next context is children in Matthew 19, 13. So it goes together very well. Why? It's constructed. It's put together by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said these words. He says, when they asked him. Now, so let me, let me skip ahead a little bit here. When they asked Jesus. I love what Jesus talks about it at the end of Matthew 19. He talks about with God, all things are possible. Don't make a mistake. Those are in exactly the same context, right, uh, of Matthew 19. With God, all things are possible. Because the question is, how can anybody stay married if God has a such high standard of marriage? With God, all things are possible, right? That is the context of Matthew 19. How can I forgive a brother? With God, all things are possible. How can I stay together with my wife and husband? With God, all things are possible. You see how Matthew puts these things in there. The Holy Spirit led Matthew to write it in such a way that you will not miss the fact that God wants you and your wife to stay together. That's God's desire. And if you say, well, how can I do this? With God, all things are possible. Remember that. Last week, you you memorized this verse, right? What God has joined together, let no man separate, right? This week... With God, all things are possible. That is true. That's from a word of our, the, the word from our Lord. Now, at the time of Jesus, if you were to read Matthew 19, it, it came from the fact that he did some healings up in Galilee, and multitudes followed him, and the Pharisees came to test him. Now, remember this. The Pharisees knew quite well what they were doing. So Matthew tells us this was a test against Jesus. This was not a question that they really wanted to know. Why? They were very happy with a status quo, the way things were. And what things were, it was this. They had a low view of marriage. They had a low view of marriage. The Pharisees, which were supposed to be the closest people to God at this point. You would say in our own vernacular, in our own thinking of today, these were the people that went to church and had their Bibles. Right? You ever notice in the Bible how many stories are about the Pharisees? Not many about the Sadducees, some, few, more than anything is the Pharisees. Why? Because the, I believe it's the Holy Spirit teaching us that the Pharisees were the original people that took the Bible seriously. In fact, prior to Jesus coming, so this is prior to the birth of Jesus, there was a move of God among the Jews as the Greeks had conquered them and made them do all kinds of sexual practices, and society was so messed up in Judea. And this is the time where they had the Maccabees and Hanukkah and all that, right? And they literally said to themselves, we're going to lose our relationship with God. This is among the Jews, unless we go back to the Bible, unless we go back to Scripture. And they began the, the, the ancient movement of going back to the Word, and they set themselves apart. These men set themselves apart, which is what the word Pharisee means. It's somebody who sets himself apart for God. So it's kind of interesting when you read the word Pharisee and they're attacking Jesus, you would go, why are the people that are set apart for God attacking God? <laughs> it, that's what you would get out of when you're reading it in, in, the, in the context, right? So prior to Jesus, this movement was absolutely engulfing men and women as well to come back to the word. To be about the people of the word. And who wouldn't want that, right? In fact, um, we would actually, believe it or not, if we were at that time, and if you wanted to go back to the word, you would probably be cut up in the original idea of being a Pharisee, right? That sounds awful now because we know what they became. But they didn't start out that way. They didn't start out that way. Paul himself says he's a Pharisee. Right? He even says, I am a Pharisee. Why? Because he held still to the original idea of a man set apart for God's purposes. So in the original context, that's what it was. 
Fast forward now to the time of Jesus, 150 years later. What you have now is the Pharisees were in love with themselves, in love with their power, in love with their position, in love with their money, because they were very wealthy, as well as the Sadducees, and they had a terrible view of marriage. Terrible view of marriage. Why? Because they had come up with this idea from two rabbis. There they are right there, at least a rendition of them. I'm not sure how they look like, but here's how they look like. At least according to the artists, right? Rabbi Hillel and Rabbi Shammai. And these were the two heavy hitters of the day. And they each had a teaching from Deuteronomy 24, which this question arises. Moses said that we can give a certificate of divorce. Is it lawful to give a certificate of divorce for any reason? This came from Deuteronomy 24. Well, each one of these men had a perspective on it because the question was, well, what does it mean, right, to have any uncleanliness? So that was what the verse said. If, you, if a wife, you find any uncleanliness in your wife, you can put her away. And you're like, what does that mean? So Hillel was the one that was more liberal. Hillel said, for any reason. She burns your food, divorce. She uh, doesn't look good, divorce, right? She wakes up in the morning and you don't like how she looks, divorce, right? She burns your food. I know, terrible, isn't it? Yeah. Um, You just don't find her attractive anymore, divorce, right? She talked back, divorce, right? So I know, how many divorces would be today, right? Now, people are going like, well, who is Hillel, right? That was Hillel for any reason. He, he made this uncleanliness to be an all-encompassing thing. Shammai was a little bit more conservative in this sense. And he actually said that, no, it has to be something sexual nature. It has to be a sexual unfaithfulness of some sort, whether before, like a premarital, like before, remember they were, they were betrothed to each other, or afterwards. And so then you can give a certificate of divorce. It's interesting. They asked Jesus that question. It's almost like saying, Jesus, which side of the aisle are you on? Are you on the side of Shammai or are you on the side of Hillel? Jesus doesn't say, yeah, I'm from the school of Shammai. I'm from the school of Hillel. He didn't say that. In fact, he didn't even say anything from Deuteronomy. He actually goes back to the very thing we looked at last week. We looked at Genesis. He says, have you not read that he created them male and female. It's nothing nothing else, male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Or the two shall become one flesh. Consequently, they're no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man set apart. Jesus goes back to the beginning. Why? Because he he understood the holiness of God. He understood the holiness of God. Marriage is a reflection of God's holiness. Make no mistake about it. It it is his character, right? It is is found in in, in this world, his character and his nature in terms of his reflection. You can find it on the earth. You can still find it on the earth. Where? Human life. We're made in image and likeness of God. A human life is sacred, isn't it? People don't think about that anymore, but it is sacred. Why? They're created in the image of God, right? Sanctity of life, it's a big aspect of it. Sexuality, it's sacred. It reflects God, right? Children, marriage, those are things that are reflections of God and his character. You can still find them on the earth. The relationship between God and Israel, the relationship between God and the church, right? These are reflections of God on the earth. You can still find them. Very hard to find now. But because marriage is sacred, man has tried to do everything they can to profane it, to destroy it. And so we need to really understand that because marriage is sacred, because God created it, it is as sacred as a human life. Meaning, I, don't, I should not tamper with it. Meaning, I should not redefine it. Why? Because in our world, We live in this evil world that redefines everything, right? And it's been redefined, and people find loopholes, by the way. And this is not only true of society. People, I hate to even say it, but people in churches. Pastor, what's one way I can get out of my marriage? I said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm not happy. 
I said, uh, I didn't know happiness was the standard in which, you know, you, you, you know. What, what did you promise? So I usually talked about, remember your vows. I was like, oh, what about my vows? I said, well, what happened when you made your vows? What did you say? Oh, I promised to love. I promised to, you know, I promised to cherish. I prom- Until death to us apart. Okay, remember your vows. Keep your vows, right? The world has profaned it. The world has profaned it. What does profane mean? Well, profane is the idea of, it's a worldview of thinking that nothing is sacred, right? In this world, we have profane. We have profane world. Right? We get the word profanity from that, right? What is profanity? Well, usually, if a man uses profanity, right, it usually has to do with two relationships, right? We usually use God's name, and we usually use females, right? Some form of relationship with females. And those two things, isn't that interesting, right? When man profanes, when man uses profanity, it, it, he attacks the two relationships that we always ought to have in the right place. A relationship with God and a relationship with women, a relationship with our wives. And yet that's the very thing that we trample on the most, God and relationship with women. And so the world is profane in this sense. Nothing sacred. Anything it's trivial, right? And so there is nothing greater than self is what profane simply means. Self is the ultimate standard, all right? So if you think self is the ultimate standard, think about, think about it like this. If, if self is the ultimate standard, then nothing that comes against self should be tolerated. And so if self is not happy, then that which keeps you unhappy needs to be removed. If self is the ultimate loyalty, then things that tell you that you need to die to self or give of yourself or sacrifice yourself is the ultimate insult. And those are the things that we need to deal with today. By the way, because people think like this, we have to understand that we live in a society that is closer and closer to Romans 1. Romans 1 talks about that scenario of God's wrath being revealed from heaven unto society because they no longer want God. They would just want to throw God off. Now, back to Matthew 19. The Pharisees wanted any cause for divorce, right? They said, for any cause, right? The spirit of the age says, it's all about self, self love. That's what the Pharisees were about. What benefits me? Turn to 2 Timothy. And Paul is going to address 2 Timothy chapter 3. In 2 Timothy 3, Paul addresses what life will be like in the last days. Now, we've been living in the last days. We're getting closer to that compression of time to the 70th week of Daniel, which you could say is the last of the last days. But we've been in the last days for some time. But this is a prophecy of society in the future. It says in 2 Timothy 3, realize this. That in the last days, difficult times will come. 2 Timothy 3, 1. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, unreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. And he said, man, that's society as a whole. But keep reading, because it says in verse 6, in verse 5, sorry, holding a form of godliness, but denying the power, avoid such men as these. Paul is not just talking about society, but he's talking about what the world is going to be looking like when people in churches, people that have some spirituality, are going to abandon the true sense of being godly and replace it with something else. In fact, having a form of godliness, they look very religious, like the Pharisees, right? Pharisees, you looked at the Pharisees, I mean, there's nobody more religious than them. If you read about what they used to do, you'd be like, man, they were strict at certain things in terms of what kept them following God, in terms of what they had to, um, obviously, they fasted, they prayed, but obviously all their prayers and fastings were self-seeking, So Paul says here, men will be lovers of self rather than lovers of God. The nature of man is going to be terrible in these days. Now, they ask Jesus the question, Jesus, which side are you on? (laughs) And Jesus says, God's. I'm on God's side. 
And, and he goes back to Genesis. So let's go to Genesis real quick uh, because Genesis 2, because this is where Jesus went to. It shows you one thing about Jesus. He always elevated the importance of the word of God in your life. Are there questions in your life? Are there concerns about your life? Are there things that you're worried about? Well, before anything else, go to the Word. Go to the Lord and hear what He has to say. Genesis chapter 2. And it's also, it shows us the importance of the Old Testament. Unfortunately, many times, many churches today won't teach it. Not that they can't teach it, they won't teach it. And they won't teach it because people are just not interested in it. Well, what, yeah. Even if they do teach it, it is usually related to some historical thing that happened a long time ago, which has no bearing in your life today. That's how it's viewed. It's just a history class. And you know what people think about history. Boring. So people just put it away. However, it's not just history. It did happen, but it is the theological meaning of who God is, what he's about, and how he behaves. And the Old Testament gives us some rich, rich stories, true story, true history, that it's good, it's good for us in our practical living, right? And this is why the Bible makes it clear. The Old Testament was for us, right? It was for us so that we can have endurance and have encouragement through the Word. Now, in chapter 2, in chapter 2, look at verse 7. God begins to do something. He created them male and female, but here's some specifics on how he did it. The Lord formed from the dust of the ground men, and he breathed in his nostrils the bread of life, and man be became a living being. Right? God created men. He gave men life. It's the first thing God does to humanity. It's a gift. Man became a living soul. You're breathing today because God said so. You have life today because God said so. And you owe your life to him. But people don't think that way. People that just go, oh, yeah, I'm alive. I guess the alternative will be worse. I'm just going to go out and do whatever I want. And then never think about, like, why are you breathing? You know, get into science or anything like that, involuntary muscles and all that. But it is amazing. It's a, it's a gift. And people try to figure out what's conscious. Like, how do you know you're alive? How do you know you're conscious? How do you know, you know, what's thinking? How do you know that you're a living soul? It's a mystery to people. That's why there's a lot of scientists are trying to figure out, you know, how the neurons work and the brain works because we just don't understand. We know how the neurons work, but what makes a person alive? How are you conscious? It's the breath of God. Amen. It's the breath of God. God breathed into man the breath of life. He became a living soul. He wasn't an animal. Verse 15. God gave them. He gave them something to do. Verse 15. It says, the Lord took man and put him into the Garden of Eden and cultivated and he kept it. God gave him a job. God gave him something to do. It's something that God always participated in humanity. I'm God. I created you. I gave you life. You need to do something with what I gave you. And he does. Now, in verse 16, God commanded man, saying, from any tree of the garden, you may freely eat. Emphasize the word freedom there. Freely eat. Freedom. God gave man freedom. And this is a wonderful thing. Why? Because Freedom doesn't come from governments or states or any particular person. It comes as a divine decree. God made people free. Right? That, that means a lot of things, right? But the freedom here is that God gave man something to do, and he gave him freedom to do it. And now it doesn't mean that they were free to do whatever he wanted to do, because you'll see it in a moment. But whenever freedom is taken away, you know what you have? Oppression. Whenever a country or society has freedoms, and we appreciate that, and we love that here in America, it was founded on those basic principles of Scripture. When that's taken away, the basic principles of Scripture, you're going to have restriction in freedom and an increase in oppression. Make no mistake about it, that's what we're living through today. And those institutions that were supposed to be freedom-protecting are now freedom-taking. They're taking those freedoms and imposing a oppression of those freedoms in a more totalitarian way. Now, America is one of the last ones, one of the last bastions of it. The rest of the world has lived under oppression and dictatorship for a long time. And as a kid, I lived through that, and I, I appreciate freedom very much and understand it doesn't come from men. It comes from God, and God gave those things. But if God's taken away, the, mark my word, it'll happen. Oppression will come very quickly, and we see that in society. Once society doesn't want God, 
it will lose freedoms. Amen. And that is going to disappear very quickly unless, unless we go back to the principles of Scripture again. Remember, the Lord gave us freedom. The Lord can take them away. The Lord gives. The Lord can take away if we're not faithful to his word. If we're not faithful to what he says. So we're going to see that in society once that is taken away. In fact, if you read, this is not a history lesson, but if you read some of the founders, uh, their writings and the documents of our founding fathers, you know what they say? They say, this republic was set up for the purposes of people that are moral because we have so much freedom and the laws are there to protect the freedoms of moral people. Their biggest fear was this. If people become immoral, they will not have freedom. And why? Why? Because a moral person protects their freedom. We love freedom. We love freedom to worship, to serve God, to do good to each other. We know that there's not a freedom to self-seek and do whatever you want and cause harm. But as soon as an immoral person sees freedom, you know what they're going to have? Bondage. Because freedom, right, with immoral values leads to bondage. You're going to find yourself in horrible bondage in terms of freedom, right? And, of course, this is society. But, you know, as a Christian, this is in a spiritual way. As a Christian, we can still have freedom even in an oppressed environment. Why? Because it doesn't depend on the society. It depends on God, right? It's a spiritual state. We're free from sin. We're free from the appetite of self and the sin that wants to, the self that wants to do all those sins. And we're free from the power of Satan. And, therefore, God gives us freedom. Jesus died for our sins. And, therefore, if the Son sets you free... You're free indeed, even in the worst totalitarian, oppressive governments, right? And so we can rejoice in that, and therefore we can practice righteousness within our freedom. But make no mistake about it. Society will lose their freedom if it doesn't turn back to God. It's just inevitable. Wow. In verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for the day you eat you will surely die. There is a limitation to this freedom God gives us. What's the limitation? accountability. Mankind always needs accountability. If there's no accountability, men will run roughshod into oppression, right? Freedom comes with accountability, right? This idea of liberation movements that you hear today, we're going to liberate this and liberate that. What they don't, what they want is no restrictions on anything. We're just basically going to do whatever it, whatever we feel like doing. And God said to men, you're free. However, you're free you're not free to disobey me. You're not free to disobey me. And so, unfortunately, a lot of our society has come, the oppression in society is because we have let freedom go and say, you can do whatever you want. And it, there's no accountability. There's no consequences to it. And the more they do that, the more oppression comes in, right? So he had one commandment. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> the Jews had 613 which the 10 are a summation of them, right? But here Adam had one. That's all he had to do. Isn't that wonderful? And Satan still came, chapter 3, and persuaded men that despite all the freedom he had, I think about the freedom he had. He had no taxes. Amen? He, he did not have a schedule. There was no schedule. He didn't have to pay bills. Hallelujah. Amen. He had freedom to go wherever the Lord had, whatever the Lord had made, he had freedom. He could eat of anything the Lord had made. He had the animals, he had everything that he could possibly imagine. And yet Satan was able to come to him and say, hey, you're oppressed. Man, you're messed up. Did you know that? You need to file a complaint because you live in oppression. And you know what man said? You're right. God's too strict. God's terrible. He's oppressing us. That's it. We like your plan, Satan, right? And he's a master liar. And I think about that. If you, I'm not going to go through it, but chapter 3. We did a study in Revelation 12 and Genesis 3 a few months ago. It's online. And we talked about how the master of psychology, it's Satan. He was able to just bring a little doubt first then a flat-out lie later. Right? And we'll, we talked about that in, that in that chapter, how a master liar, he hasn't changed. His whole mode of operandum is lies. Amen. The question is, would you believe it? 
would people believe it? Now, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone, and I will make him a helper suitable for him. I'll make him a suitable, a corresponding helper suitable, corresponding to him. Now, this has puzzled a lot of scholars throughout time. Why? Because in all of God's creation, it was good, it was good, it was good until this verse. And what did God see that wasn't good? It wasn't that it was sin. It was just incomplete at this moment. It was man being alone. And what's God's solution for the no good? He says, I will make him a suitable helper. Right? Marriage. Who thought of it? God. Who created it? God. Who defined it? God. Who witnessed it? Because he's going to bring a woman to a man. Right? Who upholds it? Who sanctions it? God. Who blesses it? God. Turn to the book of Hebrews, please, for a moment. book of Hebrews goes all the way to the New Testament. The book of Hebrews. Remember, we always have to read the Bible in stereo. One headphone on the Old Testament, one headphone on the New Testament, right? That doesn't mean you get to wear headphones, headphones here. It just means that we're listening to God through the two the, through the, 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 the two testaments or the two revelations that he gave, Old and New Testament. Chapter 13 of Hebrews. What does it say? In verse 4. Let marriage be honorable among all. Let the marriage, be, let the marriage bed be undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Now that is true, even in marriage. God is a witness to the marriage. And God says to us, I will never leave you. No matter how hard it is, I will never forsake you. So that we can confidently say, my, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Isn't that wonderful? In the context of marriage and dealing with in verse 5, of course, is finances. God will take care of it. Now, what does it say about marriage? Literally says it's to be honored by all. Why? Because God created him. And God's above us. And God is sacred. And God is holy. And therefore, what he instituted has to be holy and sacred and respected in that way. We can't undermine marriage. But society has. And they're doing it a lot. The fear is, and the concern that I have, is that thinking, that zeitgeist, that spiritual ideas filtrate into believers' minds and they get into the church and we sound more like psychiatrists and psychologists uh, and therapists than actual biblical Christians. This is no offense to anybody who's a Christian and a psychiatrist and a, a counselor, but we become more directed by those books and those ideas than the word of God, right? I praise God for those who hold, uphold the word of God, who are counselors, who are psychiatrists, who are involved in counseling, who hold the word of God up and says, you know what? You're here, let's pray. You're here, let's open the word. Let's hear what God has to say. And then we can, we can go from there, right? But that's the first thing we got to do. Now, God established it and God judges it, right? God judges those who's going to destroy it. He says here, Fornicators and adulterers, those who violate the sacredness of marriage, you have to deal with God. God will judge, right? Now, going back to Genesis, here it's very clear that marriage was for companionship. Look at verse 18 again. I'll make him a helper suitable for him. That idea of companionship, someone who is suitable, right? They are different. Men and women are very different. Don't, you know, don't. You notice that, right? They're very different. I hope you got that, right? But you know what? That difference is the key to how marriage should work. God forbid you married somebody like you, right? God forbid. Amen? This side got it. This side, I don't know what's going on on this side. Right? God forbid they would be two like me walking around the house. They both bring something. Why? What one can do, the other one can. Right? What the other one can't, she can. What he can't, she can. What she can't, he can. Amen. And you have different roles. 
And we're not supposed to be alike. We're supposed to complement that. Why? Because God, in his wisdom, gave some attributes of his character to women and some attributes of his character to men. And you can't change that. It's the way God made you. Now, it's interesting that God made them very differently, and he put them together. So, you know, people say, oh, we're not alike, and this and that, and that and the other. We're not... I don't want to be disrespectful to anybody, but really? Like, you don't know that you're different? Like, you didn't notice? And you're supposed to be different. In fact, that's how it's going to work, right? Now, how does God turn a not good into a good? He does something really interesting. Look at verse 21. In verse 21. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept And he took one of the ribs and he closed it up to the flesh at that place. Now, he took his side. The word rib, unfortunately, mistranslated even in my own Bible. I just, uh, I noticed that this morning. I was like, it does say rib. But it it is a mistranslation because we have this idea of that, right? Some kind of structure, skeletal, right? But really, the word rib has to do with side. It's his side, the side, the closest part to his heart is his side, right? And he took something from there, and he closed it up. And he did something like a death and a resurrection, meaning the word deep sleep, it's not just like he fell asleep. It's like a deep sleep. He went into almost like a comatose state. God put Adam out. He, you would say, was not available, not around. And what did he do during that time? He took his side and made a woman, out of his side. And so, very different. Because we read in verse 7 that God took clay or dirt out of the ground and he made men. And he took a side of men, the side of a man, the closest part to his side, and he made a woman. So even in creation itself, it's completely different, right? Even we are created very differently. Men come from the dirt, right? Women come from the side of a man, right? That explains a lot of our sensitivity, and different way of thinking, and maybe, I'm not saying insensitivity, that has to do with the fall, right? But it has to be with, we're just not as sensitive in that. Why? We perf- Yeah, we're dirtbags, right? We just came from, from dirt. And this is why man is very different, right? You can take a man, and you can show him something, he's got it, you know? And, and it is very different the way we think too, ladies. This is true. I'll give you one hint about men, right? Very simple, very simple, right? We like simple things. We like to have peace. We like to have peace. We don't want to fight. We like to have relationships with, with a person, right? Sometimes it's hard for us to have relationships with a bunch of people. We just like to have relationship with one person, right? We like to eat, as you can tell, right? Yeah. And if you understand that about men... It goes a long way to keeping a peace in the home, relationships. We don't want to fight. We don't want to argue. You know? We want to enjoy a relationship with the person and to have peace with that person. Right? But more than that, the way men think is like this. We think in compartments. We think in compartments. And, and it's hard for women to understand that because women don't think in compartments. Right? So I can have trouble at work, and I can come home, and it says, well, work is work. I leave it there. My boss yelled at me and all this stuff. But you know what? I'm home. I'm playing with the kids. Have fun and enjoy. Relax. Right? Compartments. I left that there. Women are very different. No, that that which happened in the morning is going to carry it over into the afternoon. It's going to carry it over into the night. It's going to carry it over into tomorrow. And it's, it's not just work. It's life. The whole thing is life. Right? So you can go and maybe have an argument with your wife and go to work. And you'd be like, hey, what's going on? Man, we're good, right? And you just get to work, and you just, you just have that compartment. There, I'm going to leave it there until I get back. If the lady does that, she would be affected by that argument, and she'll carry it into the next day, into the next. That's why when you say, well, are you still talking about that? Yeah, because she ha- it's, all part, it's all together. It's all one unit. And you're like, how could you let that go? I just don't know. I just did. I just put it in that compartment, Right? <laughs> And women don't have that compartment. It's a one, it's one closet. It's one giant closet. Everything goes in there. Men have these cubicles. It goes there, it goes there, right? And that's why a lot of times it's like, you know, 
when, when we argue, you know, a man can just say, yeah, let that go. I still love you, you know. A woman may have a hard time with that because she's still mad at you, right? She can't put it in that compartment and say, okay, that's let that go. I love you, you know. It's like, no, I'm still mad at you. I can't, you know. And so you have to, you're like, where's that verse? How do you deal with all this? <laughs> with God, all things are possible, right? You can do it. Amen. You can do it. Just tell yourself that. Yes, God, all, all things. things. That's why I had you memorize this verse. Why? Peter says, dwell with your wife with understanding. Oh, that's it. I don't, you ever read that verse and be like, okay, I'm done. I don't know what to do. Well, dwell with your wife with understanding. How can that be? With God, all things are possible. You're underst- Remember, you married her, and you married him. You know? As I often said to guys that I counsel in marriage, and I said, well, why is she like this, and why is she like this? I don't know. You married her, not me. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> you, you have to deal with her. Like, you know, now don't think my life is just peaches and cream. I have to deal with my wife too, right? <laughs> and I don't expect anybody else to deal with her, right? But me, you know, dwell with your wife with understanding. That means there has to be, not only is it possible, but you have to do it God's way. You have to understand, you know, because everyone's different. Even, even as women, right, or as men, they're all different. You know, some men are like, you know, maybe more sensitive. Some men are completely insensitive, right? And yet, with God, all things are possible to make it work. Now, we'll continue with this because I don't want to get too far away. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> so, what did God do to Adam is something that is very important to understand spiritually. Because what God did through Adam by putting him to a death-like state, cutting his side and bringing someone out of that side is exactly the picture of Jesus, ultimately in the New Testament. Because Adam is called the son of God. And the book of Genesis is called the son of God. He was created, he was created as the son of God. Remember, he had no parents He was created directly by God. And so he's called the son of God. So here's the son of God who is put into a death-like state. His side is cut open and a bride for him comes out. Isn't that the gospel of Jesus Christ? Where the son of God, the eternal God called the son, comes to earth as a man. And he dies on the cross, his side and his nails, there's nails in his, on, on his hands and feet and pierced on his side. And when he rises again, the bride of Christ is born because we're now believers in Jesus Christ. Out of his side, we come. We come from the blood and we come from the water that poured out of him. It's a new relationship with God through forgiveness and cleansing in the Holy Spirit. We have that now. We are the bride of Christ because he died for us. And so here's a perfect picture in the Old Testament of the Son of God, of a Son of God coming and his bride coming out of his side and the wound on his side. And and it's interesting because he makes this statement. The Lord fashioned a woman from his side and taken from a man and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Fascinating. Why? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh? Yeah, because he recognized prophetically that this is something that is going to happen again and again and again. God instituted marriage. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Question, were there any other people on the earth at this point? No. How did he know what a father was? How did he know what a mother was? He wasn't even one himself. He was not a father. It's a prophecy. Right? It's a prophecy. He could see into the future by the Spirit of God that there will be these relationships in the future. And the way God wanted to establish those relationships is a father and mother will have children, and those children will eventually cleave to their own spouse, and they will become one flesh. The closest relationship we're to have besides God is our spouse. No other person should come in between that, right? And there's a great joy, by the way, because it says here they should cleave to their wife, but they should leave their parents. It's an interesting thing. There's a great joy at weddings. I've done weddings. I don't know how many I have. I lost count. I've done a lot of weddings. And two things happen at weddings. It happens all the time. 
Great joy. Woo! Man, there's nothing more fun than a wedding. It is. It is awesome. They're great. Lovely. But then you see some people on this side or some people on that side, they begin to cry. And they begin to weep. And they begin to, oh. Everybody's rejoicing, but there's a few people crying. Why? Because they know one, two things are happening. One, one family is being broken up. Or two families are being broken up. And a new family is being born, is being formed. The cleaving to his wife and, and husband, or an end, I should say, the leaving of the father and mother relationship. And those are difficult things for father and mothers to deal with, right? But this is a biblical principle, right? Just like us, just like we, just like all of us who are married, we left that relationship. Why? Because God ordained the closest relationship to be your wife, not your parents. <gasps> Pastor, how can you say that? I didn't say it. God did, right? I just believe it. I believe what God says. The closest relationship will be your spouse. Now, this comes into counseling and all kinds. I'm not going to you know, make it so simplistic. Uh, it's the clear, but it's not simple. A lot of couples struggle with this. The leaving and the cleaving, right? A lot of couples struggle with this. They still see mom and dad as the closest relationship, and the husband is like uh, in the back seat. That's not going to be good for your relationship. Or mama's boy, you know, sees mom as the ultimate. And wife is like a secondary or tertiary thought. That's not good for her. You're going to have struggles. The way God intended was for you to cleave to your wife. And the word cleave is davik in Hebrew. It means glue. Not in glue, super glue. It means something that sticks together. And there's an exchange of electrons between the two the two, uh, the two surfaces. That glue is super glued. Now there's a bond. <laughs> that bond, you can't tell the difference, right, between the, the one surface with the other because there's been an exchange of electrons, and now you have a perfect unity. That's the word cleave. The word leave is to supersede that relationship. doesn't mean you mistreat your parents. doesn't mean you mistreat your mom. doesn't mean you mistreat everybody. That, that would be ungodly when the Bible says to honor your parents. What it's saying is it supersedes it. You have a greater calling to your husband and wife than your parents at that point, right? There's a greater calling. Doesn't mean you you know dismiss them. You're to honor your parents. Absolutely right, but they take their rightful place in your relationship, right? And so, primary loyalty is always going to be within the marriage bond. Primary loyalty within the marriage bond, and that comes into it, it. Believe me, that's one of the most sought-after counseling issues where couples don't leave and cleave correctly, right? Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the book of Proverbs as as we finish. In the book of Proverbs, it's quite fascinating. In the book of Proverbs, there is this, the underlying theme is wisdom. The underlying theme is wisdom. And how Proverbs is put together, it's good for young men, Absolutely, it's good for men, it's good for women, but it's good for all of us. But the primary theme in the book of Proverbs is two women. They're called wisdom, (laughs) both of them. One is called the virtuous woman. One is called the virtuous woman, and she is called wisdom. The wisdom of God personified in a woman. The other one is called a strange woman. She's the harlot. She represents the world's wisdom. And you know what she says, and interesting when you read it, and so when you read it this way, it's kind of an interesting book to read because what is the, the point of Proverbs is a father speaking to his son about having to choose a bride, but he's not just choosing a bride, he's choosing wisdom. Are you going to follow God's wisdom or are you going to follow man's wisdom? And they're personified like you would find in a You know, like a father giving instructions to your son about make sure you pick a virtuous wife. She's not going to fool around on you. She's not going to leave you. She's going to be faithful to you. Now, glad to know that at the end, what is the last chapter of Proverbs? Anybody know what number that is? Proverbs 31. And what is Proverbs 31? A lot of women know this. It's the virtuous wife. Guess who he picks? The virtuous wife. Whew, praise God, right? And the whole story of Proverbs, you're like, oh no, is he going to go with that woman? Or is he going to go with the virtuous one? And of course, this is a picture of the bride of Christ and the harlot too. Harlot of Revelation 17 and 18. 
But if you, if you read Proverbs carefully, you know what she uses? The, the, the strange woman, she uses flattery. She uses flattery. She flatters the man. She compliments the man out of all proportion, right? It's always lies and deception, right? And then it says that she's the one that has left her companion. So she had been a bride before, and now she's flirting with another man, right? Because they go from man to man. And she left the covenant with her God. Wait a minute. You know what it sounds like? It sounds like somebody that knew the Lord at one point and walked away from the faith. And now she's a seductive spirit into the world. And that's what you find today in a lot of places. You know, they have a form of godliness. Man, they look, they look pretty righteous to me. Maybe that's a good church. Maybe that's a good place to go. But they flatter and deception comes in and eventually leads nothing but destruction. If you read, if you keep reading in the book of Proverbs, it says, don't go down their steps. Her steps lead down to hell. Boy, this is a tough woman to deal with, right? Her steps lead down to hell. Whoever messes with her, it's like shooting an arrow through your liver. That's painful. And many times, right, this is good for men. This is good for women, too. But it's also understanding how deception comes in. How deception comes in. And, um, and this is, we have to be very careful. Now, in the book of Malachi, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip because we've got to be done. In the book of Malachi, God it's angry with the people of Judea, the Jews at this time. Why? Because they were not sticking to the word of God. You know what they were doing? They were promising all these things. And if you read verse 13 and 14, I wish I can get into it, but verse 13 and 14, is, it's, it's the primary thing. Because what they were doing is that they were dealing treacherously with the wife of your youth, God says. You're dealing treacherously with her. What were they doing? Now, this is before Jesus came. You know, 300 years before Jesus came. What they were doing is they were saying, well... We marry them, but we're not happy anymore. We're not compatible anymore. We're just going to leave. We just write her a certificate of divorce and we'll leave. And God says, you don't do that. And you know why God was angry even more? Because it says that those people would go, the same people that were divorcing their wives, they would go to the altar of God and they would fill the altar of God with tears. Oh, Lord, you're so great. God, please go. Oh. And they would raise their hands and they would sing songs to the Lord. And then they would close up the the tabernacle or the temple, and they would go back to their, not to their wives, they would go back to their harlotry. They would go back to other women, and they would leave their wife. And it says, God says, I hate divorce. I hate what you've done. You left the wife of your youth. You deal treacherously with her. You broke the covenant that you were supposed to make. And this is really sad. Why? Because many people have been like this. I'll tell you a personal story, and then and I'll, I'll, I'll finish, just about finish, because i gotta, I got to finish here. Um, there was a couple here one time, a long time ago. They're not here now, but so it's, it's, I'm free to talk about it. And uh, he had become, a, he was a new believer, and he had his wife. And then they came to me for counseling, and, and I wanted to know what's going on. I, I, I knew him a little bit. Well, she had been a Christian for a long time. And he had been a non-believer for a long time. And they got married. She was unequally yoked. And, but she stayed. She stayed with them and prayed for him for a long time. He becomes a Christian. He becomes a Christian, right? And it's, uh, it was wonderful. However, throughout this process, she become hardened against him. So by the time they came to this church and wanted counseling, she wanted nothing to do with him. And she wanted a divorce. And he was a brand new Christian. He says, well, I don't want to get divorced. It's just, I found Christ. I, I, I want you. I want to stay together. And she about had it. And she came to me and I says, you know, I believe we should get divorced. And I said, well, you know, you, you have no biblical grounds to get divorced. The Bible doesn't say to do that. She became irate. She became so angry. And I said, well, God told me I could divorce. And, and I don't know. You know, I usually don't say this like this, but it, it must have been the Lord. And I said, yeah, God told you that. The God of this world told you that. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus never told you that. And she became so angry, she left, you know, cussed me out and everything, and um, calls me back about a couple of days later. And I'm here consoling the men. She said, Pastor, don't worry about it. We're not coming back. Oh, I'm not coming back. She says, I found another pastor who told me it was okay to divorce. Yeah. So you see what happens is even in the church, even people that will, will claim to be born again, 
tried to find, I mean, she was looking hard for a loophole. And I said, well, he was a drunk. Okay? He was this. He was that. He was, he was angry. He was that. Okay, does he do that now? No. Okay. Then there's no, there's no, no. Well, he was like this. And I said, well, I probably was like that too. It's all about what they, you know, she couldn't find, she was trying to find a loophole. Well, he did this a long time ago. This is, did you forgive him? Yeah. Okay, then stay together. Nope, 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 I'm done. And always, but you know what? In this day and age, you'll always find one. You'll always find somebody that will tell you what you want to hear. This is the great deception. You will always find that strange woman. You will always find a pseudo-spirituality, a fake spirituality that will tell you it's okay. My friend, do not be deceived by that. Please do not be deceived by that. Stick to what God says. Stick to godly people that will tell you even the hard things. Anybody here have a brother in the Lord? Men. Talk about men. Brother in the Lord who will tell you the truth? Even if it hurts? Even if you don't like it? Yes. Love that person. Amen. Keep that person. Love them. Cherish them. Why? How many people like that? Ladies, do you have somebody like that in your life? A sister you can confide that will tell you the truth? Even if you don't like to hear what, what she's saying? Anybody here? All right. If you don't have one, find one. Exactly. Seriously. Why? I'm not talking about finding somebody rude. That's not what I'm saying. Finding somebody that loves you and tells you what God says, even if your flesh hates it. Right? right. right? Now, sometimes the messengers get shot, so people that, you know, if you're doing that kind of counseling, don't worry about it. God will see to it to protect you. But it is the reality, right? Now, let's finish with this. I was going to talk about that. We'll talk about it next time. Covenant love. Christ in the church. Christ is the model for the husband. We'll talk about the roles next week. The husband has a model. It's Christ. The husband has a model. It's Christ. The wife has a model. That's the church. And in that relationship is how we see how God intended for marriage to be, right? Christ is the husband. The wife is the church, right? That's the model. It's the example. What is the husband called to be? Like Christ. What does Christ do? Or what did he do? He laid down his life for his wife, right? For the marriage. It's about saying no to yourself. I say that to men before. I say, it's easy to take a bullet for your wife. I know men in this fellowship, you guys love your wife. And if there's something that happened, an altercation, you would take a bullet for your wife. I know that. And, 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 and I believe you. The hardest part is this, is to die daily for her is to die daily for her. Meaning saying no to yourself every day. I want to win the argument. No, no, I don't have to win the argument. I'm going to seek peace. Now, if you seek peace, she might get mad. She might expect you to get mad. But seek peace anyway, right? Seek peace. Lay down your life. Say, honey, I love you. Let's pray. How many try that? I mean, I've tried that in the middle of the most heated argument, right? You know, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because all of you is saying, no way. We are not going to humble ourselves before this woman. We are going to win this argument no matter what, because I'm right. You know, sounds like I have a lot of practice on that, huh? Right? <laughs> it is. It, it, so that's, what, that's the battle, saying no to yourself. Now, what does it mean to be a church? To love and honor and obey Christ. What does it mean to be a wife? The same. Saying no to yourself. And live for someone else. See, the church is called to live for Jesus. The wife is a companion to her husband. She is to accompany her husband and put herself aside for his beha- on his behalf. Well, was he going to do that for me? Well, I just said the husband has to lay down his life for his wife. Now, what happens if they both do it? It is a marriage that God is well pleased. Now, does it, now, now this is the standard. I'm not saying it happens all the time. Why? We live in a fallen world and society fills our mind and philosophy fills our mind and our spirituality. And it says, well, I don't have to do that. I mean, pastor, you said the word submit. I'm out of this church. I actually had a lady one time told me that. Don't say that in marriage. Don't say that in my vows. Do not say submit in my vows. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't. I have to quote Ephesians 5, <laughs> you know. 
I, I can't. Oh, I'm not really sorry, but I can't do it. I can't. You're, you're saying that I'm, you're going to want me to alter the word of God? So, so you and your whatever, your entourage is well pleased? I said, I'm sorry, I can't. And I said, finally I agreed to do it. Looked at the guy and said, man, I'm praying for you. <laughs> praying for you. Because that's, that's the philosophy. Don't say that. Don't do that. Don't. Why? It doesn't fit within society's structure. Don't say men are men. Don't say women are women. Well, God did. Right? We have liberation now. Well, liberation with accountability and consequences. Right? God gave us freedom. Right? God gave us freedom. And this is a serious warning. Right? At the end of the day, it's this choice, my friend, brothers and sisters, it's this choice. Man is trying to reverse all that God created, right? You look at what's going on with the institutions that God created. Think of marriage. Think of male and female. Think of the languages in the world. Now we have uh, um, artificial intelligence that there's no separation of languages anymore. You can speak into a, um, a certain electronic device and it spits to you in the language that you want, Right? Just because God divided the languages for his own purpose so that man would not unite together and try to bring down God. That was the whole purpose of the Tower of Babel. Yeah. God controls the weather, not man tries to control the weather. God says, I'll give you rain. Not man says, we don't need God. We'll, we'll just bring our own rain. And they've been doing that for a long time, by the way. The days of Baal, the days of, uh, the days of Ashereth, and the days of Dagon, right? Those were all gods that controlled the weather. They prayed to them. And they said, well, God says, I'll be faithful to you. You're faithful to me. I'll bring you rain. God, they said, no, we don't need God. We're just going to pray to these guys here, and they're going to bring us the rain. And God says, if you worship those gods, I'm going to shut off the rain. I'm going to make the rain look like, the, the clouds look like brass, and you have no rain. And that's what happened. Horrible things. Read, the, read the, the, the account of Elijah. Elijah uh, was a man who didn't make it rain for those specific purposes. They were playing, they were trying to play God with other gods. The culmination of it all is this. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, I'll read if you want to turn there, but this is the last verse we'll read. It says, in Revelation 19, this is the very end, the very end of human history in terms of the de- end of the age. Verse 7. Let us rejoice and let us be glad and give glory to Jesus, glory to God, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Are you getting ready to meet the Lord? We're still talking about a wedding, by the way. And was given to her, clothe herself, and was given to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and clean, for the linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Fine linen. Find that in the book of Revelation. All throughout is the righteousness that is given to us by Jesus. And then we're to act on it and practice righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ put on us. And now it's our righteousness. We have to act on it. Verse 9. And he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. The invitations are sent out. The marriage supper of the Lamb. The end of history is a wedding. The beginning of history is a wedding. The end of the age is a wedding. And forever and ever after that in eternity, it'll be like a honeymoon, like a, an eternal honeymoon. Why? Because now all of God's people are in relationship with God. All of God's people are in relationship with Jesus. Did you know this, this, this idea of weddings were also the teachings of Jesus? Jesus gave this incredible story in Luke 14, you can find it and read it on your own. It says, there was a king who was going to have a wedding, and he invited all these people. And all these people, RSVP, they said, yes, we're going to come. Yes, we're going to come. Yes, we're going to come. And then the wedding time came. They're going to kill the fatted calf. They're going to make all the food. And then they started getting rejections. No, I can't come on the day of the wedding. I can't come. I can't do this. I can't do that. And the king said, fine. Go find anybody that wants to come. Go to the highways, go to the byways, go to find anybody. They found the lame, the poor, the blind, and they said, we're going to come. We're going to come because it's the greatest day. It's the wedding of the king. And people who knew better, who had the original invitation, were cast out. People that knew were cast out. My brothers and sisters, this is the gospel. The gospel is a wedding. 
you could become so familiar with the things of God that you despise it and reject it eventually. And the wedding invitation goes out and he says, you know what, I got other things to do. I got more important things to do. And people that have heard the gospel, maybe for the first time, are so excited. They're like, man, this is the best thing I ever had in my life. I mean, think about it. I mean, if you brought somebody that was really poor, I'm talking about really poor, and you served them a banquet meal, they're going to be like, man, this is the best. Man, you see this thing? Amazing. You see this water? Pure, clear, crystal water. But maybe you were raised up like that. And he said, no, oh, that food again? Eh, don't really like it too much. I'm going to grow out of style. How about some fast food? Let's get out of here and go to some fast food place, right? And you're like, are you crazy? Literally, you're living this banquet to go for garbage? No offense if you're going after that for that. But you say, you're going for that? Well, people in churches can become like that. It happened to the Pharisees. They became so familiar with the things of God, they ignored it, profaned it, and didn't care for it, and found loopholes around it. My friend, as a Christian, I've been a Christian for some time now. Uh, I don't know how many years, but for some time now. And you may be a Christian for some time now. You have to fight against that. You have to fight against the familiarity that you grew up with and, and figured out, oh, I don't know that. I already know that story. I already know that story. I already... And find the Spirit of God every time you hear the Word and say, God, what are you teaching me? I want to be teachable. I want to know. I want to grow. Because why? I don't know everything. You think I know everything? No. Right? And the day that you think you do, you don't. Right? It's like pride, right? As soon as you say you don't have it, that's when you most definitely have it. And so you have to f- continually fight against it and come into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's going to be the most happiest time that you'll ever have in your life. Times a million, plus a million, times a million of the best time you ever had in this world. Multiply that by infinity. And that would be the greatest joy you're going to have in that wedding. And all the sorrows and all the difficulties and all the things that you had to deal with, whether you're married or not married, are going to be forgotten. And it's going to be joy and holy anticipation, right? Are you ready for that? Well, marriage is under attack. Keep yours. Keep yours. Follow what God says, but get ready for the bigger one. We have to get our family to be ready for this event is coming, the marriage supper of the Lamb. However, God said, if you deal with marriage, if you deal treacherously, if you try to tamper with it, you're going to have to deal with God because God's relationship with us is like a marriage and your marriage reflects Christ. How does it look like today? If you need prayer, stay after. If you need encouragement, stay after. Right? Find other believers who would encourage you and pray for you. Every one of you should have, if you're married, every one of you should have somebody that prays for your marriage. Seriously. And if you're not married and looking to get married, you, have some, you should have somebody in your life that says, you know, um, help me to get, you know, Lord, help me to get married. Pray for that person. And if you don't want to get married, then you pray for others that want to get married and pray for other marriages, right? Because God is in the business of restoring families. And maybe you have a broken marriage and you say, what's the point now? God can, God can bring it through. God can fix it. He can. And we'll talk about that next week. Let's pray now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and bless you for all that you've done, for all that you've given us, life, work, ministry, a calling, a spouse, relationships, other believers, Lord. Thank you. All that we have is yours, Lord, and you gave it to us freely through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we ask you to help us not only to have a true view of marriage, a true view of what you want for men and women in this world, Lord, but we would have the heart to faithfully follow what you have to say. Lord, it's an ungodly world and it's an unfaithful world. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be godly. Lord, we are not the model. Lord, we might be hypocrites to our own standards. Lord, we ask you to forgive us and we ask you to help us follow the true model, Jesus Christ, the true divine bridegroom, the one that we one day will see face to face, the one we would one day give an account. We ask you that you would help us have a revelation of Christ in our own lives, that we would take him seriously. We would take our relationship seriously. We would take our relationship with our spouse seriously. 
Lord, we pray that husbands and wives in this church will be godly, full of God. That's what it means, full of God. And we praise you that you could do it because with God, all things are possible. In the name of Jesus, amen. I bless you guys. We'll see you on Wednesday.